All right. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends. My name's Laura Marks, and I'm greeting you from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations in what was now called Vancouver. And I'm delighted to um, uh, introduce our panel, Bending the Possible, One Pixel at a Time, Small File Echo Media for the Anthropocene. And each of us is going to give a short presentation of about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for conversation. So uh, we are all involved in the Small File Media Festival, which I founded here in Vancouver in 2020. Uh, Azadeh Imadi uh, is a maker and theorist and um, a small file media artist. Uh, Radek Pshadpowski is also a scholar maker and a member of the Small File Media Festival team. And Joey Joseph Malvin is a, a musician, activist, and member of the Small File team. And I'm now going to introduce some um, uh, why why I decided to found the festival, and um, uh, what are the issues uh, in the um, carbon footprint of the internet that make it urgent to uh, consider uh, decreasing the size of streaming media files. Okay, so uh, it may not be very well known that um, the carbon footprint of information and communications technology now constitutes um, as much as 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason for this is that um, data centers, networks, and devices all consume uh, significant amounts of electricity, much of which is derived from fossil fuels. Uh, so this is not only a quite alarming scenario in the present, but because of increasing use of um, uh, ICT applications involving ever larger files, uh, um, the uh, electricity consumption and um, greenhouse gas emissions are projected to rise um, really quite uh, astronomically uh, to as much as 7% of 2016 levels of global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 15% uh, in 2040, which is um, truly uh, an ecological disaster. Now, a group of us media scholars and ICT engineers spent a year and a half reviewing the research in ICT engineering to try to get an understanding of the causes of this electricity consum consumption and carbon footprint. Uh, Radek and I were the two media scholars on the team. This research was in part prompted by the 20, 2019 report of the French think tank the SHIFT project on the, uh, the unsustainable carbon footprint of online video. And the SHIFT project did an enormous amount of research into the electricity consumption of streaming video. And you see from their interesting chart here that um, they figured out that about 60% of all online data flows uh, is streaming video. Other organizations such as the statistical organization Sandvine have said 60 to 80 percent. And it's interesting to see here that um, video on demand such as uh, Netflix and uh, Mubi constitutes 34 percent of that use. Uh, pornography uh, perhaps surprising 27 percent. Uh, YouTube and other tube type type um, user-generated channels, 21%. Uh, 
uh, the SHIFT project did a calculation of the carbon footprint of uh, individual actions online, including watching an online video and sending an email. And uh, it happens that the SHIFT project's calculations, although very thorough, uh, were based on some incorrect uh, initial findings and methods. And in our research, we compared methods by a number of ICT engineers to calculate the carbon footprint of streaming video. Uh, what I want to focus on here is that um, there are a number of influential ICT engineers who speak not only within the scientific community but also um, to the public um, who try to put a reassuring face on the uh, energy consumption of data centers, especially also networks and devices, and um, try to uh, reassure us that data centers actually um, are not consuming significantly more energy than they did 10 or 15 years ago because they are so very efficient. Uh, however, if you look at uh, this chart that shows up very often in um, what I think of as these rather conservative ICT engineers publications, you see this, uh, this flat line that says um, since about 2008, um, data centers have not used any more or all, hardly any more electricity uh, despite the uh, much higher number of um, calculations and storage they're required to do. So this looks very great. And here are some, uh, you know, from a 2015 article, here are some uh, projections that with certain kinds of efficiencies, uh, data center electricity usage can even decrease. However, uh, what, uh, what that chart doesn't show is that um, most ICT engineers agree that there's going to be a spike in data center energy consumption in around 2024 uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is that the, uh, the well-known uh, Moore's Law, which we'd be better to call you know, Moore's you know, tendency, uh, is coming to an end for the very interesting reason that um, um, semiconductors have for a long time been able to, uh, to shrink, uh, thereby, um, you know, Moore's Law, I think, predicts uh, uh, t by uh, doubling in their capacity every two years. But this is because um, they are able to work at ever lower lower uh, supply voltages. But when that um, voltage gets too low, the transistors start to leak electrons. Um, and we are just about reaching that point now. So this diagram shows some um, <laughs> the happy electrons leaving the, the prison of the um, uh, uh, semiconductor. And the um, ICT engineer Hubert Kayslin, whose quote you see here, um, criticizes the very kinds of uses that we're concerned with, such as streaming video, as the, the reason for this unsustainable pressure on data centers and the other components of ICT to, um, to keep becoming more efficient. So I'm going to quote a bit, I'm going to quote him. While it is utterly clear that there can be no further progress without corresponding improvements in energy efficiency, the quest for better video resolutions, the current move towards storing everything in the cloud rather than locally, the desire to communicate even with humble objects over the internet, and similar trends will in all likelihood continue to drive up the energy demand of, of ICT as a whole. Unfortunately, CMOS scaling, which is what Moore's Law was counting on, 
can no longer be counted upon to yield the same gains in terms of performance, efficiency, and cost reduction as in the past. So uh, if uh, data centers are going to continue to be efficient, they're going to have to find uh, another way to do it. ICT engineers are working desperately to find these new efficiency measures, but we would argue that um, rather than try to accommodate ever more volume, um, it would be more appropriate to decrease the volume of files used. Um, briefly, uh, we surveyed uh, the numerous different calculations of streaming videos, electricity use, and carbon footprint. And by triangulating with the report from the SHIFT project, we found that um, their calculations pretty much line up with those of ICT engineers. So this suggests that the SHIFT project's uh, calculation that streaming video is responsible for 1% of greenhouse gas emissions globally is probably correct. We're just uh, over nine uh, minutes, Laura. Sorry to interrupt. Nine minutes? Okay, thanks. Uh, however, um, it's imp uh, the problem that the SHIFT project made in their calculation is that you cannot add up individual streams um, to calculate the overall electricity consumption because uh, data centers and networks are running all the time. Um, it's compared by the uh, uh, engineer um, uh, uh, priest to uh, airplanes that are uh, flying all the time, no matter how many passengers are on them. And so some people say uh, it's good to have more and more uh, consumption uh, of by streaming video and other products on uh, data centers and networks because that makes them work at peak efficiency. But in fact, what's happening is that more and more uh, ICT infrastructure is being put in place, um, data centers and networks. And I should also mention that our devices, which are designed to be obsolete, um, consume about 90% um, of their lifetime electricity in their production. So when you receive your phone from the factory, it's already, you know, most of it's an enormous amount of electricity consumption has already occurred. So if there's no other takeaway from, from my part of our presentation, it's that one way to mitigate the carbon footprint of uh, information and communication technologies is to keep your phone as long as possible. All right, so I will uh, stop presenting and turn it over to Radek Pshatowski, uh, who is a scholar and media artist um, who uh, uh, is currently teaching at Trinity College Dublin and um, is uh, kind of the, uh, the guru of the, the small file video. So Radek, it's over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Laura, for <coughs> your, your kind uh, introduction. Um, and uh, the title of my presentation is Small Fire Media in a Blade of Glass, Grass, The Lure of the Cosmos in Experimental Ecomedia. And I'm going to talk about the Small File uh, Media Festival. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to start. Um, Laura has um, painted the picture um, of uh, the carbon footprint of uh, streaming media, how massive it is. Uh, but the question uh, remains, um, what can we do uh, about it? So uh, what can we do to reduce the carbon footprint of streaming media uh, as media theorists, as makers, 
And in response, um, Laura has founded uh, the annual Small File Media Festival uh, back in 2020 to lovingly celebrate low bandwidth movies that stream with no damage to the planet um, at a time where the pandemic saw a marked increase in streaming video. And the festival has already had its two uh, iterations and uh, we are uh, happy to announce that we just launched the call for its third uh, edgy iteration called Think Thrice Funk Chic, which will take place the summer between the 2nd and the 9th of uh, August, 2022. But uh, let me start from the beginning. So um, what are small fine media? So uh, these are media works of no more than five minutes in duration and of no more than five megabytes in file size. Um, and these are images designed to use the least possible bandwidth in online transmission. So uh, for moving uh, images, the Small Fi Media Festival suggests a goal of one megabyte per, min per minute. And um, in, uh, for comparison, uh, for example, a high definition video with uh, 24 frames per second uh, frame rate is uh, anywhere between 60 and 350 megabytes uh, per minute. So uh, obviously the small file is a um, great uh, response uh, to this. Um, and um, additionally, um, to tackle specifically the pandemic conjunction of streaming and serialization, uh, last year we also introduced uh, our novel benchworthy category um, that we also called 22 Mags of Trouble uh, for <clears throat> media series uh, between three to eight parts total file size 22 uh, megabytes and up to 22 minutes uh, in length. So um, it's, it was this kind of um, new intervention um, in, into the small file media that, that we did. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, last year's um, edition of the festival. Uh, so over 10 days in August, 2021, uh, uh, the festival screened over 100 works by artists in 16 countries to 165 attendees. And we received um, lots of works uh, on very different topics. So these are topics ranging from worms to universes and beautifully executed in techniques ranging from glitch art and data moshing to traditional hand-drawn animation. And uh, we have uh, curated the works into 10 different uh, tantalizing programs. So there's a um, really short sample uh, here. Um, so uh, lots of um, really varied programs as well. Uh, these are um, not only about the aesthetic, uh, they were also about the political, um, as you can see here, uh, program nine, pandemic technologies of control. And um, what was also really important is that our festival was accompanied by panel discussions focusing on different perspectives on small file media. So uh, we had makers forums, uh, small file aesthetics panel, an ICT uh, engineering panel, um, and uh, also a youth panel. Uh, and what was also really important was that the documentation of the festival was compressed to small files before sharing them on uh, Vimeo. And um, last but not least, we have given artists our official selection awards in a range of categories. And our winners have received the coveted small file uh, mini bear, um, a really coveted award uh, for. Uh, everybody. Um, and uh, now um, our website gives information on aesthetic and technical solutions for producing small file media, as well uh, as about literature on the carbon footprint of streaming media. Um, so um, what are our small file solutions uh, for makers? Uh, so uh, first of all, it's about, uh, we recommend using obsolete media. 
um, having uh, artworks with stills and audio, um, uh, using uh, and rediscovering animation as well as, as GIFs. Um, and also, uh, it's a really interesting path to work with compression algorithms such as Handbrake, any video converter, FFmpeg. Um, and you know there are so many uh, other uh, solutions uh, for makers, and all those uh, this information is included on um, our website. Um, okay. So, what are small file movies? Um, to take a more uh, philosophical, media philosophical path, um, as Laura has very poetically pointed out, small file movies travel by email laugh at Kumi's law, embrace compression, our pool media, our haptic, our surprisingly high resolution are not poor images, uh, contrary um, to uh, what Hito Steyer would say, are intensive, not extensive, beguile the imagination, are salubrious, uh, connect you to the cosmos, and uh, to riff off the title of our ICEA presentation, they bend the possible one uh, pixel um, at a time. So uh, you can also see uh, a little um, selection of uh, the works uh, submitted. For example, uh, the wonderful Mel by uh, Lian Dunik, uh, my Instagram by Hani Rashid. And um, what you can see here um, is actually another uh, of the artworks submitted. Uh, Daniel Carter's Star Trek Voyager intro into 383 kilobytes, which is basically a based web-based animation that boldly goes uh, where no one has gone before, all within the infinitesimal space of the eponymous 283 uh, kilobytes. Um, okay, so let me conclude uh, my uh, presentation with um, my understanding of uh, small file movies. They ponder the mystery at the level of the pixel of how an extreme compression of time space can nonetheless engender new vast universes. And by the same token, these inframedia show how we can make do with less, affirming the image not as a wholesome high fidelity representation, but as operative nothingness diagnosing the environmental degradation under the Anthropocene. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, finish on this note and I'm going to pass it over to uh, Azada Amadi, uh, who is um, going to talk about the ontological or uh, cosmological uh, dimension of the pixel and small fan movies. Thank you very much, Radek, for your um, introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and huh. So what I decided to talk about um, today for this um, really exciting and interesting um, panel is to talk about pixel and the potential that uh, can be revealed through pixels if we think about them differently. Um, and to do that, I've decided to actually um, share with you um, process of um, or creative process that um, I engage with in order to understand pixels and um, explore moving image from a pixels point of view. I'm showing this um, video particularly because um, it was a very crucial point in my thinking about moving image. This video was um, primarily made, um, well, actually what you see here in the left screen is a video I shot in a bazaar of Tehran in 2010. And in the process of investigating moving image and the potential hidden within a moving image, I dissected this video into 11 frames um, per second. 
in order to investigate and explore time and motion in the moving image. However, later on, I decided to um, dig in deeper um, into the actual moving image and really seek for the potential um, in the image that we see. So I made um, the video in the right hand side, which is an extreme close up of a point from um, these other image um, as and as you can see what we have is this pixelated ambiguous and abstract footage. Now the process in which I um, decided to make this extreme close up was uh, really involved by or in a way um, intrigued or initiated by um, a Persian Islamic philosopher called Mullah Sadra Shirazi um, from uh, 16th century. And his idea of um, time and movement um, that's hidden within each entity at the level of substance. Um, I was intrigued by that idea and I wanted to um, investigate and understand um, the potential further and um, the idea of pixel through this experimentation also um, came into surface for me. So I began to um, look for new aesthetics, new forms, new experiences within already existing moving images. I briefly show you um, this diagram just to give you an overall view of Mullah Sadra theory of substantial motion which I just mentioned to you. And his theory is interesting because for him, the linear time, the experience of linear time and movement is basically um, informed by an internal um, form of time and motion, which is um, at the level of substance and linked to this other realm, which is invisible and immaterial and links directly to the divine realm and the divine time. And that whatever happens in the material world um, is continuously changing what happens to our um, other aspect of us in that immaterial realm. And um, changing us both in a material way as well as an immaterial way. And in this process, we have intensification. So we become, or entities, not just humans, all entities become more singular as they change in the material realm. So, and as you can see, this idea of materiality, materiality, a linear time that is also linked to an imperceptible and um, imperceptible realm and um, a time that is related to the divine and presence was very intriguing for me and for my practice, um, which then led me to basically um, explore pixels further. And in relation to the actual moving image that we see, thinking about what we see as an image, as um, a figurative form that, that um, within itself, has this other form of movement and time that's hidden from our perception. So it is that potential within, again, what we see. Um, I was intrigued by this discovery that um, inside existing moving images are actually other form of time and experiences and also possibility for seeing and experiencing world in a different way, potentially in a more simple, way, which according to Mullah Sadra, the most simple aspect of entities, which for him is substance, are closer to that um, immaterial realm and the divine realm, which will allow this internal change. Um, and through this simple aspect, entities can, or yeah, we can um, expand our imagination. So, for my practice, it became quite important to think about imagination through uh, Pixel's point of view. But here it's not just Pixel as what we see on the screen, but even 
every other element and entity that we have outside of the screen. Every single tile, every single line, every stone that we come across. Um, so all of those, we can think of them in terms of their most simple elements and how our video or how my video practice and uh, my thinking around time, movement, um, image, pixel, materiality of digital video can actually um, open up new um, possibilities hidden within these elements. And I think the imagination um, through these other point of view or most simple aspect of entities became quite important for me because um, also what Mullah Sadrak refers to as the interconnection amongst entities. And that is driven by this simple, the simplicity within them. But also what um, other Persian Islamic philosophers say is um, suspended images uh, or Muthul al Mu'allaqa. Shahabuddin Sohrevardi, um, which actually is very well known, another Persian philosopher, um, very, is very all, well known for his concept of imaginal realm and imaginal perception, um, refers to imaginal images as images that are suspended um, between the material and immaterial realm, images that are not in a place nor in a locus, but um, um, have the qualities of both. And for me, I'm very much simplifying these concepts, but just I'm trying to focus on my own practice here. But for me, pixel and the qualities that the pixel offers opened up possibilities to think about these other images and allowing a space for um, discovering new images that are placed between the material and immaterial world. And that is because pixels, because of their quality as algorithm, their algorithmic quality, but also their um, very much tangible material qualities, um, allow us to think between these two realms. So with these ideas in mind, um, I like to propose a method of making and thinking about moving image that takes into account um, the micro elements, um, the micro elements like pixels in the digital moving image or a micro element in every other thing as a way of making um, artwork, as a way of thinking about world and uh, exploring um, the cosmos. So here I'm uh, going to show you an extract of a video that I actually showed in a small media file in 2020. And it's very much about um, using a microscopic view, um, trying to grasp that kind of like simplicity amongst different entities, or in this case, the objects that was around me in order to perhaps unrip reveal the connection, the interconnection amongst them, but through experience um, or a viewer's experience of the image. So I'm going to show you just a short extract. Um, I assume that this link can become available later in case you're interested to see it.
I think my 10 minutes is already finished. So um, thank you very much. I can, yeah, I would like to pass it on to uh, Joe Malbon, uh, who's um, actually um, artist as well as activist, as Laura mentioned earlier on. And um, yeah, thank you, Joe, please. All right. And uh, can I just get you to exit out of the full screen there? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, my name's uh, Joey Malibon. And before I uh, kick this off, I do have one of our little coveted mini bears here that Radic uh, was talking about earlier that we give to our award-winning recipients at the Small File Media Festival. Um, he was 3D printed by my good friend Elgin Sky McLaren. And uh, yeah, just want to give her a shout out for helping print these little bears that I uh, created in the open uh, source software program Blender. So I'm just going to share my screen here and I'll kick things off. And is that working for everybody? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, this is my first time doing one of these, so please bear with me. I've never been on a panel before. I'm very excited to be here. I wrote a little intro for myself, which I'm going to try to breeze through because it's been done a couple times now. But uh, yeah, my name is Joey Melbon. I'm a musician, lens-based media artist, and researcher into small file eco media. I recently completed my master's degree in comparative media arts from Simon Fraser University and uh, under the supervision of Dr. Laura Marks. So thank you, Laura. Um, and there my focus was primarily on on forbidden and illegal mediums of pirate radio and pirate television. Uh, but during my studies through Laura, I got absorbed into the ultra tiny world of small files. And uh, since then I've uh, become a an organizer at the uh, Small File Media Festival. And uh, a lot of my presentation is gonna be featuring works from the Small File Media Festival. It's pretty busy at times. There's a lot of video going on. Uh, so you'll be on my wavelength through this, everything all at once. Um, and I'm a fan of media archaeology as well. I like outdated devices and equipment uh, in the creation of media art because I like the aesthetic and the unique feel that it has. Uh, and I also just like the fact that it keeps this uh, trash or keeps it from becoming trash in landfills, um, which is also an important part in keeping our uh, ecosystems clean and healthy. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking primarily on small file videos and how to make them, uh, covering a few of the aesthetic and technical solutions that can be used in making small file eco media. Uh, so here's a video trailer featuring clips from films submitted to last year's small file media festival, just showing some of the diversity of what we received. And um, at the small file media festival, one thing that we have is a one megabyte per minute file size limit. Some artists skirt around it a little bit. It's a new thing coming on, but it's essentially the benchmark that we try to hit with a small file media festival. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm gonna be sharing one possible method of compressing video files to hit that benchmark. And uh, why small files? Well, the smaller the files sent across networks, the, less, uh, the smaller the carbon footprint because less electricity is being used during the whole process. Uh, I'm then going to discuss some of the small file potential of experiment or the of the experimental art form. Uh, I'm going to be looking at data moshing and the demo scene as experimental art forms that are also kind of uh, entangled with small files. Uh, so let's look at some of the aesthetic solutions that we can use to make small file eco media. Uh, but first, I'm going to be kind of looking at two different modes or styles of uh, compression that we use here in making small files. The first is small file techniques for quality, where we sort of retain the fidelity 
of the small file image, um, well reduced in its size. And then we're also going to briefly look at small file techniques for compression, uh, where we kind of push the limits of what a small file can do, really crush these files down into teensy tiny sizes. Um, so the first kind of aesthetic solution is shooting small, shooting for quality. And certain film techniques are more suited for small file clarity. Uh, so this clip is from O'Hara Lane by Colin Wilson Croft. And this incorporates many of the aesthetic techniques that can help produce a small file video file in um, pre-production. And this one screened at the first small file media festival in 2020. Uh, so as I said, certain methods lend themselves more to small file making as they result in videos with less data that needs to be compressed. Parts of a video with shared characteristics such as a shared background and soft focus require less processing power to compress and creates a smaller file as it contains fewer unique pixels and less data. So the more areas that are similar to each other, can it gets copied over frame to frame and the algorithm knows not to kind of like make more and newer data for that. And so it squishes it all down. And uh, so anyway, some of the techniques that can be used to um, prevent the use of data overrun and filming is using minimal camera movements like a tripod or holding it as still as you can as a static backgrounds result in the overlap of data from frame to frame. Recording and editing the audio in mono is a huge one in mono instead of stereo because all of a sudden you just have half the data that you need to work with uh, using shallow depth of field uh, as the bokeh contains less information than sharp images and shooting at a smaller resolution so 480p versus 4k. Um, so now that we looked at a few of these set solutions to use to shoot a small file, let's look at some of the compression uh, techniques. And uh, here's just a quick look at some of the different programs uh, we you can use to squish a big file down to a little file. Most of them are cross-platform, open source, and free. Uh, there's Avid Muse, Any Video Converter, Handbrake, Virtual Dub. Uh, Radic also does a really great deep dive into FFmpeg over at smallfile.ca, uh, where not only can you compress it, but you can also do some really unique uh, video um, effects in it as well. Uh, so when it comes to making small files, I'm most familiar with Handbrake, and I'm going to walk you through the steps I took to compress a 2015 short film I made called Jerry, Jerry, Jerry from a 56.6 megabyte MOV file to a 3.6 megabyte MP4 file that adheres to our one megabyte per limit limitation. And uh, as you can see, I have the original uncompressed version of the film playing on the left, simultaneously with the newer compressed version of Jerry, Jerry, Jerry on the right. Um, and you can see there's a qualitative difference between the two, but they're both fairly clear. Uh, so I chose this film as it already had some of the aesthetic technical suggestions that we had in making a small file. So we used static backgrounds, tripod shots, capturing footage at a resolution of 640 by 480 on an older DSLR camera as well. And because this film was shot at 480p, the original file was only 56.6 megabytes. So it's not that big compared to uh, the big HD files that most people are viewing. Um, and it, it compresses a lot easier. It uses less processing power on the laptop that I was doing it on, which also uses less energy and extends the life, the, the life, extends the life of my device through less wear and tear. Uh, so let's have a quick look at how we can shrink this video down and how I did that. So as I said, I did it in Handbrake. Um, I'm just gonna do some slides with the tutorial. I'm not actually showing us how. Anyways, when you open the program, you can then drag and drop your file into it. It'll look somewhat like this on the screen. Um, so that, that part was pretty easy to actually open the file. Uh, so next I went to the video tab. You can see it next to the big red arrow there. Um, sorry, I went to the video tab and I reduced the video quality by adjusting the compression rate factor or RF factor. You can see there's a slider uh, just the, below the little red arrow there. So an RF of zero means no compression, an RF of 51 is maximum compression. And after some trial and error, I was happy uh, with the result of uh, getting the RF at 36. And so I then hit render, the green start button, and by then the video was 7.8 megs. So that's still over twice the one megabyte a minute standard. But a big part in making small file video is the audio. And so 
um, the original audio codec was set at 320 kilobytes per second as a stereo file. And you can see the little arrow on the line there. I then set it to a mono file with a bit rate of only 24 kilobytes per second. And doing that halved the size of my video. It went from 7.8 megabytes to 3.6 megabytes, hitting our small file benchmark. Uh, so other people, uh, have also used compression techniques to make ultra, ultra tiny files. And so this video that we're looking at is Expedition Sasquatch by Andrew Roach. This was submitted to last year's Small File Media Festival. I don't have the audio playing, but you should check it out. It's a very hilarious video where this fellow goes on a hunt for Sasquatch. And he managed to fit um, a 12 minute, 54 second video into a 2.6 megabyte file. So the audio really does a lot for pushing this one along, uh, but you get caught up in the aesthetic of it and there's something quite endearing about it. Um, other folks use data moshing as an aesthetic uh, technique as well. This is a clip here of Noise of the Stream by Andy Cazzarelli. And uh, this was submitted to our 2020 uh, film festival. And uh, it uses compression itself as the aesthetic tool to data mosh this. So data motion similar to glitch art is a practice based upon the intentional glitching of digital media. And this was done in Avid Muse by uh, manipulating the orders of the keyframes in the videos. The video or the video player doesn't know what it's looking at. It tries to force the video through with all these glitches and the actual coding and coding of the video. And it results in this like weird world of artifacts sliding into each other. Uh, so just briefly, something new that we've been looking at in small files is executable files. Um, and so, an ex so these kind of are born from the demo scene and demo scene broadly refers to a computer program subculture formed around the creation of demos, audio video presentations made with code that runs in real time. And this medium grew as an offshoot of media piracy in the 80s. Um, and hackers would kind of add their own digital tag to pirated software, uh, sort of like digital graffiti. And then from that, they took their skills into making these longer art forms. And this is a, a little look at a demo called The Black Lotus by Aeon. And it is a 512 kilobyte demo created for the Commodore Amiga, a computer uh, made in 1991. And I, I think it's an astounding level of um, quality in the visual and the audio in it as well. It has like this good little EDM track going on. I quite like it. I'll have a link to that on our little section of the smallfile.ca as well. The reason we're talking about executables is because the smallest file ever submitted to Small File Media Festival was this one by, it's uh, by Byte Observer. Um, or sorry, this says it's Byte Observer here. And so this file is a screen capture of Blake32 by Martins of Super Rogue Marquee Design. And this executable file was only 32 bits, not bytes, so extremely tiny composed entirely from 64 characters, which you can see in the lower left-hand corner. So this is the smallest file and it's a very, very beautiful little video. And that was actually a screen capture of the executable. So at the end of it, I went a little bit long, apologies on that. Uh, so why do I think small files are important? Because this, on top of information and communications technology being responsible for at least 3.3 to 3.8% of global carbon emissions, there's a physical toll as well from the entire media infrastructure ecosystems that are taking place on the planet. Uh, so everything required to make the devices that we're used to produce and screen our small files are all built upon rare earth metals that are being extracted um, and doing massive damage, but also these devices through planned obsolescence are getting thrown out way too early. In 2021 alone, 52.2 billion tons of e-waste was generated globally, and that number is just continuing to rise. Uh, so we need to start thinking small to reduce our carbon footprint if we as a species are intending to survive the current climate catastrophe. We're already watching it unfold daily in high definition, so maybe it's time to go big and think small. Thanks for letting me go over time. And that was me. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joy. It's a really interesting presentation. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we still uh, have a bit of time. So 
uh, I suppose we could uh, use this time to share um, our thoughts and impressions and uh, most importantly embark on a dialogue. Um, okay, so Laura, would you like to start? Yeah, I would. I, um, I have a very uh, um, poor connection here, so that's why I have to turn off my video and it's and my old computer is why I can't share our um, adorable uh, background. But uh, yeah, th thank you, my, my brilliant friends. This was just a, a fantastic panel. Um, uh, I think I'd like to start with um, uh, a comment uh, on uh, Azadeh's beautiful presentation. Uh, because you, you do your work and your um, your thinking show so very well how um, uh, the very tiniest element can can actually have a cosmic connection and I think uh, as a group we, we look at this two ways one way is um, in the materiality of small file media because uh, a small file movie is able to be honest about its debt to the material infrastructure the way most uh, high resolution streaming is not. But Azadeh, you add a philosophical understanding of how the infinitesimal connects to the infinite. Um, so I guess it is a, it's a comment, but I would be happy to hear you say more. Thank you, Laura. I'm um, flattered for your comment. <laughs> um, yes, I think for me personally, if I can hopefully be clear about my ideas here, um, it has to do with the simplicity that I mentioned um, in the talk that seems to be within everything. And for me, the pixel itself um, and it's it's really it's very much related to what um, Joy was basically mentioning in terms of simplifying certain information and then making it available um, to others without damaging the environment. Um, for me, what is simple, it actually can um, link us more deeply to other entities um, because it's almost like the shared element. Um, within us and all other entities. And I think um, Pixel themselves are very interesting examples because um, if with other things we have to think in abstract way in order to grasp that idea, with Pixels they're actually able to index these other elements, the simple elements um, from the environment and actually show it to us. Um, and I just think um, it's, as you just said, one pixel at a time can make um, a new experiences. And I just see a lot of potential in that. I don't know if I'm actually really responding or, um, to your comments. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah that's, just... yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. It's like our common the the simplicity that uh, all of us beings have um is what we have in common That's yes yeah and i think for me actually when i think about um like almost like developing a method a method of thinking and making that perhaps a single pixel can potentially introduce to us is it has to do with going back to the root of things which the root of things um, are simple. And again, restarting from that point rather than just straight away going with something large, something that we straight away grasp, but in a way kind of maybe reversing the process a little bit here and then see what happens through that process, through reversing and um, going back to um, the simple unit. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now, now I have a... a technical question for you that maybe um, uh, Radek and Joey would also like to respond to, which is that mm -hmm. usually in compression, um, 
what we see are not individual pixels, but pixel blocks, because that's, um, that's uh, the compression algorithm's easy way to approximate that um, you know, there's a group of pixels that are pretty much doing the same thing. Um, so it seem, it's not as elegant as you're um, thinking about a single pixel. What would you, uh, what do you think, do, do pixel blocks also have that kind of ontological simplicity? Um, to me, they actually do um, be, in a way because they're kind of like indexing the other pixel. And it's really interesting because I personally feel, and perhaps it also relates to some of your theories on haptic visuality, there's actually quite a lot of, um, in a way, eminent um, information and experiences within that kind of like block of pixels. Mm. Um, and I think the potential in those type of imagery is um, it has to do with the imagination that I was mentioning. It has to do with how can these other form of images and aesthetics and forms activate our imagination. Um, and I see a lot of potential in those type of imageries. Mm -hmm. Yes, Radek just brought up an image, which um, kind of, yeah, it's, there, I mean, just looking at it, it's just, it's a different way of creating visuals and thinking about moving image and images. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Radek, will you say something about this uh, fantastic work by Derek Kwan, Bombay Beach? Uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, I I think uh, what's really interesting uh, about this, it's interested as uh, in pixel blocks is kind of interstitial beings that are flash with, you know, the footage of the sea foam rising on the shore. And there's this um, incredible moment when this pixel blocks and the footage of, of the, this frothing kind of uh, foam um, um, on, the, on the seashore when they become indiscernible, which is really um, amazing. So I suppose this um, is a um, uh, kind of parallel techniques to Azada, Azada's techniques, but it's also a kind of, uh, difference. Um, and um, I also perhaps want to say a bit uh, about uh, respond to Azada's uh, presentation. And I thought it was really beautiful moments when you showed uh, the entangled orb. And, um, and this is also some adventure of the audience as well, because for me, it's uh, in a really palpable sense, was expressing this idea of, you know, suspended pixels, that this pixel at this really, the very tiny, the infinitesimal, they're like not finished. It's not the something that you reach and there's nothing beyond, but this is where the adventure starts. And I really like uh, when your kind of vision hovers over those objects in um, extreme close up and pixels is also the time it takes to try to perceive. So mm -hmm. this this uh, something that you showed really beautiful uh, in the diagram of Mula Sadra, this kind of a kind of progress, this kind of uh, spiral movement towards perfection. It also reminds me a bit of a Bergsonian duration that mm -hmm. you know the pixel it's not finished, it's the time it takes, and um, and I really appreciated this. My experience as a viewer, a kind of you know suspending you know all this um information that we are already given as you know as a sort of uh, as a cliche and then uh, and something that you have shown us it's something that is yet to explore uh, and i think it's pr really beautiful because it's precisely at the interests of the intelligible um, and the sensible. So thinking and matter. So thinking, making, making, thinking, it's all really entangled in the imaginal realm. So I was left with this image and um, 
it's it seems that you know the small fire media it's not just like material substance but it's the movement of thought itself and the entanglement of both so mm. yeah so that was thank, my... thank you very much Rode. you explain it really well <laughs> and also thank you for mentioning i'm really pleased that you said suspended pixel i actually meant to say that and i forgot <laughs> So I actually love how you picked on that and that, um, yes, thank you. Hmm. Uh, I'd like, I have a, another question for our friends, which is, um, uh, so obviously we are all big fans of the um, creative things that you can do with, um, with small files and with compression, but um, I do think it's a, a hard sell because um, you know, most people hate compression. And um, I, you know, I, I did until, uh, until small file techniques convinced me. But um, uh, how, how, can we, how can we encourage people like, like our audience here at ISEA who are you know, very you know, thoughtful and knowledgeable um, media makers and theorists how can we um, uh, uh, encourage them to to love what you can do with compression? Can I start with uh, Joey to answer? Sure. So I think people already love small files, but they don't realize it already. And so the thing that makes me say that is I'm just thinking about like memes and memetics and those are crushed and it's almost like the more illegible the meme the more the, the funnier it is and I think part of it is that because compression like with the big pixel blocks and the chunky look that we we're talking about earlier it kind of creates a new tension between like the viewer and the object itself because you kind of don't know what you're looking at and so there's all these hidden potential in these homes it's like each block is like a little home for an idea you're not sure what's inside and you want to know what's in there and, and somehow it kind of occlude you know occludes what the, what it and was originally but it creates new possibility and so i kind of deked around the question but i do think people like small files already and also the aesthetic is is getting thrust into um media already is aestheticized, that aesthetic is fetishized in high quality media. And I don't think it needs to be. And also people put up with low resolution because as soon as your hot, you know, your uh, signal to your cell phone hits a cloud and blows up a little bit, you're still gonna watch your show at a lower resolution. You're just gonna be like, oh, the TV's doing a thing or whatever you're still going to watch it. So I think we're being sold high definition, but we don't need high definition. Yeah. Beautifully put. I love your sentence. Each pixel block is a home for an idea. Mm -hmm. Very practical. Rat Radek, do you want to add? I, I totally agree with Joey. I think, uh, you know, already there's, like um, to uh, what effectively is a low res TikTok and all those forms, they already prioritize something which is um, small. Um, and, uh, but at what is actually not good that still there's some high resolution which is presented as an alternative and as i see it and this is what uh, joey already mentioned this is out of touch with uh, the taste um, of, of HD. 
Mm, yeah. yeah, maybe we should all turn our video off. No, I actually no. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm just I just switched to pure audio. It was just the transition. Uh, but I think you know th there's still something to be embraced about you know the role of audio. And when the connection breaks, it's you know just the beginning. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean one one thing that we're doing with the small file video festival is inviting people to um, to love the infrastructure and to care about the infrastructure and not to see it as an obstruction, but as you know something that is um, struggling to uh, transparently maintain um, the appearance the appearance of immateriality um, you know driven by a, a, you know, capitalist need to um, uh, addict consumers to beautiful high resolution. So uh, we, we love moments like this, <laughs> yes. moments of typical yeah. And breakdown. also uh, what they do, they kind of insert this, uh, a dose of contingency and randomness and, into mm -hmm. uh, otherwise something which is, you know, really media controlled. Um, and as do uh, um, filmmakers, all around the world that might not have access to, you know, high-speed uh, internet, and they still make uh, amazing experimental um, videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also um, perfectly uh, entertaining, perfectly adequate uh, narrative films and documentaries. So, as Joey was saying. You don't need high resolution to have a captivating story. Yes. Can I also make a recommendation? Please Hello. do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's interesting because now that we don't have images, I don't know if you are here, if you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then hold. Um, I just I just put on my video for a minute, or shall I not do that? Oh, go ahead and risk it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Um, it's just that because I got an invite that's um to turn on my video. I don't know why, but anyway, I actually would like to say to those who um are in doubt is to actually try it, and just make one a smile. Uh, media file film and send it to the festival mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because I think actually the act of making and thinking through idea might change their mind they might realize um, the great amount of creativity and possibility that goes into thinking about um, making in a different way and through uh, a small file Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, uh, so many, you know, compression aesthetics is a, a fantastic new field for creative exploration that um, a lot of the movies in the festival are exploring and in, um, especially in Radek's tutorials with FFmpeg where he shows the results of uh, different kinds of compression on the same image. Um, I'm starting to think that um, uh, compression is useful for different kinds of genres. Uh, for example, there, there's a kind of compression that gives a sort of smeary continuity um, to all the um, objects in the image field, which is really appropriate for horror film and for melodrama because it suggests how everything is uh, connected on the surface of the image but on the other hand you can also um, use compression 
to heighten the boundaries of figures uh, and that has a more kind of um, uh, um, you know, maybe a bit more oh, who's that uh, Swedish filmmaker with the really dark films Bergman Yes, more, thank you, more yeah. Bergman-esque, where every yeah. figure is kind of locked into its interiority. And so you know, many, many more fantastic ways to experiment with compression to, um, to make your, uh, your image expressive. Yes, uh, Laura, I, I can say I can totally agree uh, with what's amazing with compression aesthetics is that it's a kind of alchemy. It's, um, it's, you know, experimenting with, you know, all those settings and um, working out a threshold, um, uh, this kind of subtle balance between this invisibility and something appearing. Um, and this is, has also really, um, I suppose, a drift of, uh, Azada's um, presentation, this imaginal quality, because it's you engaging intimately with 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 this 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 program and what it does. There's no way of knowing beforehand, mm -hmm. and, and um, so something that, um, for example, Joey shown for the FF uh, MPEG, these are the settings that might work uh, best in the context of his particular image, but for other image, it might be each time it's, it's different. Uh, and it's, um, it's a way of uh, a kind of exploring the image or unfolding something out of it that we don't even realize, which, mm -hmm. which is so uh, amazing. Um, as uh, one of our award categories was for the festival, it's a kind of act of haptic renunciation because mm -hmm. almost like you are engaging with this compression aesthetics so intimately that it's like a path of renunciation you're like in the moment and you renounce all that which is non-essential which is this kind of almost like a mystical experience you know? mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the realm of the esoterics a bit you know? yeah that's very nice Rade. I was thinking it's almost like listening to the film that you're creating in order to find that right aesthetic and form that works. So it's, it becomes almost like a dialogue you may have with whatever material you're developing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, what, what we're saying, we, we're encouraging uh, artists and audiences to do more with less, but what the festival emph emphasizes is that that doesn't have to be any kind of hardship because the, the deeper you go into the image, the more you discover and the more uh, connections you find you within the image and to other images and to other things and to the infrastructure itself. Joey, would you wanna add? I just, I, I was thinking about the little picture that as they had in, on her uh, presentation showing how like there's the different planes of like thinking and like imaginal and perception. And I kind of think that HD is heretical and soulless because it kind of gets in the way of the imminence. It's like showing you this big shiny thing. And mm -hmm. it just kind of occludes potentiality because you can't break through and think anymore. You're being told exactly what's going on and therefore you don't have to think anymore. And I don't like that about HD. Mm -hmm. HD occludes potentiality. Yeah, it, it has this, um, it, it gets us stuck on the skin of the image and the things that the image represents. And of course, I mean, we, we all love movies. You know, we love um, how movies can show us things that we've never seen before or thought about. But, but often, you know, most of the time, movies show us what we already know too well and they confirm um, you know thoughts we've already had and uh, exactly um, uh, block the imagination. 
Joe, you're coming up with some gorgeous sound bites today. HD occludes the imagination. Does anybody want to know anything more about the uh, infrastructure of ICT? <laughs> well, another thing that I would like to mention um, that is, uh, you know, adding even though, yes, it is very true that um, data centers and networks and devices are getting um, ever more efficient, at the same time, they're being asked to do more and more and more, you know, streaming in 4K, streaming in HD, um, the ideas of holographic streaming, and you know, we haven't even mentioned those other beasts in the room, which are um, cryptocurrency, and artificial intelligence, which um, use massive, massive amounts of uh, electricity and currently are just not as common as streaming video. But one thing I want to mention is that 5G networks consume a great deal more energy than 4G, and the G just stands for generation, so fourth generation and third generation. Um, fourth generation networks are very energy efficient and uh, they brought us to a good place. 5G has been calculated to use uh, six times the electricity of 4G. So this, that as well, you know, on top of all the, uh, you know, political ramifications of, um, uh, you know, the geopolitics of 5G is really a good reason just to say no to 5G. And so is those really ugly 5G antennas that are sticking out of the tops of buildings in downtown Vancouver where I live, like uh, electric larvae. So another message is um, say no to 5G because of its um, really catastrophic energy consumption. I suppose uh, we, we could also add uh, this um, important aspect of the carbon footprint of streaming media um, is also uh, a consideration of uh, the, the Jeevan's uh, paradox, uh, which mm -hmm. is whereby the, you know, uh, the more efficient technologies, the more use they um, um, encourage, which is mm -hmm. kind of really paradoxical. Exactly. Um, because, yes, uh, because yeah, always, you know, you have those slogans, uh, for example, in uh, Dublin, where I'm based, you know, all you can eat data. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's this, this, um, this idea that, you know, that since the connection is fast, um, everybody should use it fully, you know, it's all you can eat. It's like this mm -hmm. eating, eating metaphor that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you bring up the Jevons paradox, uh, also known as the rebound effect, which is a, the simple fact that um, the more uh, technology becomes efficient, uh, the more use is made of it, canceling out any savings. So we see this with streaming video that um, not only are more people streaming in higher resolution to more devices, but also many new kinds of platforms have come up, um, such as video chats, um, you know, Peloton, so video, you know, video phone calls now becoming the norm because it's possible. Um, that crazy uh, exercise company Peloton that streams your <clears throat> streams um, uh, video training training videos in, in HD to your bicycle and, um, you know, all the other ways that uh, in just in a very few years, streaming video has come to seem like this immaterial resource. So, uh, yeah, we need to always point to the rebound effect and a difficult thing is to ask, to ask people to go back to a place which, although it's only a few years ago, um, can seem like another world. But I, I feel that uh, we've had a, a 
very beautiful, wide ranging conversation from um, infrastructure to the imaginal realm. And I think we've mentioned a lot of um, really exciting creative possibilities for artists. So it might be a pretty good place to, to wind down and uh, invite, invite our audience to um, check out the Small File Media Festival. And also, you know, from the festival site, you can connect to our research site and read some of our articles and our 60-page report on ICT engineering. Um, uh, would a couple of people like to have a last word? I just wanted to say I was really delighted to participate in this panel and uh, I really hope that uh, everybody who is watching this will get interested in the small fine media and will send their works to the festival. Yeah. Send us your beautiful movies. Joey, do you want to add? And, and small file executables and whatever else you want to throw at us at smallfile.ca uh, because we're really excited to see where uh, this festival is going to go and where all is going to go. And uh, also, I want everybody on screen quickly so I can get a picture of all of oh, us yeah. as a group shot. Oh, but while you're doing that, I will mention our categories this year. Correct me, you guys, if I get this wrong. Uh, so this year, we've got three sizes. No. Um, molecules, um, which are under one megabyte, um, five megabytes or less, uh, five megabytes of fun, and uh, 22, the 22 megabyte binge worthy series. And uh, we've got four, um, oh, Radic, can you do the four categories? There we go, thank you. Molecules, ripples, and trouble. And um, we're introducing, one of the new categories we're introducing this year is NSFT art for uh, not so fucking tiny. Um, so we invite artists to, uh, to send us their work, um, referencing, if you want, the uh, NFT art aesthetics. And we are going to have an NSFT art auction on uh, the closing night of the festival. And uh, the uh, uh, successful bidders will get to own the video and we're going to give you a stamped certificate of ownership. Oh yes, uh, NSFT uh, portals, uh, which we've been talking about, you know, portals to other time spaces, uh, song, we're really inviting people to uh, make uh, uh, musical movies, uh, tiny talks, because TikTok files actually turn out to be pretty, pretty uh, substantial and not in the good sense. So make your tiny TikToks and we have the exciting other category for anything doesn't that doesn't fit into those themes. Azadeh, last word from you. Yeah, this is super exciting. Um, all I want to say, first of all, thank you very much um, for this panel. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, but to those who are um, watching and listening to us, I guess, um, all I would say is to really um, ask them to explore possibilities and see what comes out of it. Um, I think uh, thinking about um, small files uh, is both a way, it can be both way of making, but also way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I like that possibility very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Five megabytes of fun. Yay. Ooh, small files. See you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.